Welcome back to another episode of Brain Buzz Podcast. I am Drake and Kyle is still away looking after his new baby born boy, Logan. Uh, so we are happy to have uh, a guest on today at Dr. Edward Slingland, who is a professor in philosophy and associate in psychology and Asian studies at the University of British Columbia. Uh, and he is the author of Trying Not to Try. And he's coming on today to talk about his new book, uh, Drunk, the book about how we sipped danced and stumbled our way to civilization it's an unreal book i got a little extra early copy so i got to get a little peek into it but he's he's on today to talk about why we drink and why it's kind of shaped our society and our civilization as it is so edward thanks for coming on no oh, thanks for having me yeah no i'm really stoked to have you on so i'm gonna lead uh, you have a ton of uh podcasts and lineups to, to talk about your book and i'm like one of the first few which i'm pretty happy to to be um i have one question you're probably gonna get a ton but i gotta ask what was your last drink that you had <laughs> what's the last drink that I, had? <laughs> I had a digestivo last night okay <laughs> and what's your favorite Italian what's your Italian favorite Italian drink favorite. of all time edward uh you know i'm, I'm really into wine so mm -hmm. Um, I, although I kind of go into hibernation mode when I'm back in Canada, cause it's <laughs> impossible to get anything decent here. Um, okay. So if you had like version. one, what's your favorite, like, do you have a favorite bottle of wine that you'd like name drop? Um, yeah, there's not one. I like so many different types of wines, mm -hmm. but really like California, cool climate, coastal Chardonnays are what I'm into. Okay. Um, Amazing, so yeah. Like uh, Fogarty or um, Fort Ross. I have a place in California that's on the Sonoma Mendocino border. And there's some local wineries there that do amazing kind of okay. small quantities of that kind of wine. So this is an informed take on uh, on wine yeah. right here from an author that background. just wrote about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So, what's your least favorite drink and why? Beer. Okay. <laughs> which is you know it's funny because i've been on uh two psychologists for beers and i just i <laughs> refuse to drink beers <laughs> i think i have a i actually think i have a I, I like the taste of beer i think i may be allergic to hops or something because oh. when i i can drink like maybe a pint and then i just feel really full and i mm. never want to drink a beer again <laughs> for like a month so um, yeah i'm not a big beer drinker Okay, so we're at like complete opposites here. I'm a beer drinker, yeah. trying to get into wine though. I'm not I'm not allergic to wine, which is nice. I'm trying to get into it. Right. So I'll take your recommendations and kind of run with that. Um, so so Edward, we're, we're on to talk about your book today. It's there's a lot in this book. It's talking about why we drink as, as like humans and why it's kind of developed us as who we are in our civilization. W there's a couple of things I want to touch on before we jump into into the book and like some of those ideas. And there's there they seem simple on the on the surface, and a lot of people think they know what they mean. But I like to always define th things before we get into you know anything too heavy. So what mm -hmm. what is legally drunk? Like what does that mean? What does it mean to be legally drunk? Yeah, it it depends on the purpose for which you're defining it and the jurisdiction. Right. So mm -hmm. usually I think most jurisdictions, if we're talking about drunk driving, that's the typically what we want to define drunk. It's are you drunk driving? Um, and most jurisdictions, it's 0.08 BAC, blood alcohol content. So that's about it's about two drinks for your average guy, let's say. I mean, uh, guys are heavier. They can drink more, um, maybe one and a half for a woman. But it really depends. There's so many variables. It depends on if you've eaten, depends on. Um, how quickly you drink it depends on what type of alcohol it is. But yeah, so about point, point 0.08, about when you start to feel pretty good is when you shouldn't drive. <laughs> yeah. It's also around when your creativity, all the best uh, features of alcohol kick in at about yeah. Point 0.08. Yeah. So. And so what's the difference between being legally drunk and intoxication? Like what's, what is intoxication then? Is that the same thing? Yeah. Intoxication is just a general term for uh, being impaired by some chemical substance. So okay. um, that's why I use intoxication in the book to refer more broadly to the book's called Drunk. Mm -hmm. And I'm focusing primarily on alcohol just because alcohol is the king of intoxicants. It's the far and away the most popular. It's been, we've been doing it forever. 
Um, it's the most important. But I also talk about other types of chemical intoxication. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, cannabis, hallucinogens, um, kava, which is an intoxicant used in the Pacific. Um, so intoxication is a broader term for any type of impairment with a chemical substance, cognitive okay. impairment. And then drunk would refer to just specifically doing it with ethanol, right? With properly when we're talking about alcohol, it's the ethanol molecule. Right, right, of course. Okay, great. So those are all good definitions to carry forward for, throughout this because you use them throughout the book. And it's, you know, it's important that we know that we're not talking necessarily about legally being legally drunk here at a certain point, that threshold that mm -hmm. we're talking about by law, but it's, you know, this intoxication or using of a substance to get into a different kind of mindset or as you said, creative mindset, that actually is something that you talk about in the book. But um, let's start off with why we get drunk in the first place. So what is this? Why do we drink as humans? Because that's such a it's such a um, it's just a, it's it's omnipresent. It's always there. Like everybody's drinking no matter what. Like since yeah. a kid, you just you're aware that adults did this. Uh, and yeah. now as adults, we're just aware that all adults do it. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so why are we, why do we drink? Like, what is the purpose of it? Yeah. So the, I mean, the shallow answer is because it makes us feel good. Right. So the immediate proximate cause is that it makes us feel good. So mm. that's the psychological, if you want to think of proximate psychological mechanisms, that's it. It's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. um, the more interesting question is why does that, proximate psychological cause exist. So why do we get pleasure from this substance? Um, and, or, or, you know, if it's an accident, why ha hasn't it been selected against taking pleasure from drinking? Um, so the standard, I, what motivated me to write the book is that the standard scientific story about this, if you look at most psychological textbooks, um, they're gonna tell you, they're gonna give you some sort of evolutionary mistake story and by far the most common is just a, what I call in the book, the hijack, uh, hijacked hypothesis. So we have reward circuits in our brain that evolved to reward us for things that our genes want us to do. Um, and alcohol and other types of um, recreational drugs happen, just happen to randomly be able to pick that lock. They're able to trigger that reward circuit. Um, we are very clever primates and we figured this out and we were like, awesome, <laughs> we get this reward for doing nothing. Let's do that. Um, so that's the standard story. So if you, on the hijack hypothesis, uh, our taste for intoxication is, is very similar. So another classic hijack is, is masturbation, right? right. Or non-reproductive sex where we're getting this, uh, huge payoff, right? That evolution reserves like the best thing that could happen to a human being for the thing that most directly serves the genes purposes, right? Yeah. Statistically speaking, getting copies into the next generation. Um, but then we figure out all different ways to game that system and get that payoff without doing the thing we were supposed to really be doing. Right. Um, so that's the, the story is basically drinking is like masturbation. It's, some, yeah. it's a way we <laughs> trick evolution and get a reward for no reason. Um, there are some what I call evolutionary mismatch hypotheses bouncing around out there. Um, probably the most famous is uh, uh, Robert Dudley at Berkeley. It's what he calls the drunken monkey, monkey hypothesis that um, we used uh, the smell of ethanol as a very volatile molecule. It travels long distances in the air. Um, and so he thinks that the smell of alcohol is basically, was a dinner gong for our ancestors. We smelled ethanol. We knew there was some rotting fruit somewhere that had you know, a lot of calorie content, vitamins, and it enabled us to find this fruit on the jungle floor when we were evolving. Um, right. And that's, it's a kind of, he's been pushing this for a while. There's a lot of problems with it. <laughs> One of which is that we, we actually don't really like overripe fruit. Most species don't. We like ripe yeah. fruit which has a low alcohol content. Mm -hmm. um, there's various theories about, well, it helped us preserve water or purify water. So if you take water that's contaminated and you turn it into beer, it gets, it's, you can drink it. Right. Um, the problem with that is you can also just boil the water, which is a lot simpler and faster and actually doesn't have any of the costs of turning it into beer. Yeah. Um, there's all kinds of theories about, um, ennobling grain. So it's also true that turning grain into a beer 
creates the, the process of fermentation creates micronutrients that aren't in the grain if you made it into bread. And there's some theories that this is what allowed um, early agricultural people in like Mesopotamia to survive on what was a really boring diet. I mean, they were basically bread and water and beer. Um, but the, from the beer, they were getting the kind of micronutrients they weren't getting because they didn't have fresh vegetables and fruit. Um, but none of these really, none of them are very convincing. All of these supposed functions um, are actually served by other things much more efficiently. Um, but that's another type of, so on that story, our taste for alcohol is kind of like our taste for junk food. So again, you know, loving sugar and fat and protein and gobbling as much of it as you can when you find it was adaptive until really recently, until the invention of, you know, junk food. Um, so in that case, it was, so in these theories, our taste was adaptive in our evolutionary past, but now it's maladaptive. Is the, that's the other type of mistake story. Um, the problem with all of these, I argue, is that alcohol is so incredibly costly that it's, there's going to be a massive amount of pressure to remove that. If it's a mistake, there's a lot of pressure to correct that mistake, both through genetic and cultural evolution. Um, and it's, you know, it's costly to individuals. It's really harmful to your health. Um, it can harm your liver. It can increase your cancer risk. It's very addictive. Alcohol is one of the most addictive drugs we have. Um, and a considerable proportion of the population is genetically prone to alcoholism. So there's a good, estimates vary, but it's possible as many, as much as 15% of the population can't drink safely. When they drink, they drink to excess. And that leads to just massive problem, social problems, um, individual problems. Alcohol leads to all sorts of disorders. You know, in the modern world, drunk driving and fights and sexual assault and all sorts. So it's, it's a really dangerous substance. And so if the fact that we like it is just an evolutionary accident, there'd be a lot of pressure to fix that. Unlike junk food, which is a super recent problem, and masturbation, which, you know, whatever, <laughs> waste a little time in the afternoon, your genes aren't going to get too worried about that. Alcohol is a lot more dangerous than masturbation. Yeah. Um, and so, okay, so why hasn't it been fixed? One possibility is just, you know, genetic, genetic evolution can't work unless it's got variation to work with, right? So you need to have a, a mutation that would be helpful. So it's that's I call that the availability problem. So it's possible that there just isn't a solution genetically out there yet. Um, that could be that could be what's going on. Okay. Um, another issue is path dependence. So sometimes something gets selected for for some reason. Siri thought that path dependence was some. Um, he's gonna help you out <laughs> yeah to explain path dependence to you um you know why don't why are our backs so shitty we have really crummy backs right mm -hmm. and it's because evolution can't just start from scratch so we evolved from tree dwelling primates our back is fine for a tree dwelling primate and then gradually we became upright and evolution couldn't go, oh, well, this now, this design sucks. Let's start all over again. It right. stuck with what got decided before. Um, yeah. So it could be that it just can't, there's no solution available to it in the adaptive landscape. Um, so then I walk through the fact that, that that's not true. <laughs> yeah. So um, there is a very good genetic solution to the problem of alcohol addiction or our taste for alcohol. And it's the, this, um, it's actually a, uh, Two, at least two mutations that go together, travel together, which is interesting because okay. they're not on the same chromosome. Um, huh. They tend to go together. Um, that evolved, as far as we know, for the first time about 7,000 years ago in Southeast Asia, probably around the time rice agriculture started. Um, but people with this, um, with this mutation have what's sometimes called the Asian flushing syndrome. Right? They drink alcohol and their face turns red, they get nauseous, they get um, uh, hot rushes, they really they become very physically uncomfortable. Um, and this is because in the, there's a two-step process where we break down alcohol and their enzymes that do the first step are really efficient. They have a double whammy where they're very good at converting ethanol into acetaldehyde, which is the, the, the middle substance, but which is also really toxic and bad. 
but then their enzyme that breaks that down into acetic acid is really slow. And so the image I use is kind of whenever when I read about this, I, what came to mind was Charlie Chaplin, you know, in modern times where he's on the conveyor belt and it's just coming faster and faster and he's not able to do it. So all this um, acid aldehyde builds up and that's really toxic and that's what leads to all these symptoms. Um, if if you wanted to design a genetic solution to the problem of alcohol, this would be it. That would be because it. Yeah, if you absolutely. can sip it. So if, you know, great. If you need the vitamins, you get your micronutrients but you don't drink to excess. And yeah. it's so effective for that purpose that a, a chemical version of it is used to treat alcoholism. So um, mm -hmm. alcoholics are sometimes treated with something that basically causes them to react to alcohol in the same way that people with this, this flushing syndrome have. Mm -hmm. um, so, this, so this genetic solution evolved at least 7,000 years ago. It's been bopping around in our gene pool. And yet, if you look at its distribution, it pretty much stayed in East Asia. Um, it spread a little bit to Korea and Japan, but didn't go very far. Um, it also arose independently in parts of Eurasia uh, or parts of the Middle East and Europe. So there's actually a couple small places where it arose in the Middle East and Europe. And similarly, just never spread. And so given the enormous, you would, what you would think, if, if, if our taste for alcohol only imposes costs on us, no benefits, it's just costly. It's weird that groups that had this mutation didn't spread them to other people. Um, you'd think they would do so much better than people who like to drink. Um, so that's the, there is a genetic solution out there, but it's just kind of fizzled. It hasn't gone anywhere. Um, the more, even more convincing in my mind is the fact that there are cultural evolutionary solutions to the problem. And these are more obvious. It's just prohibition, right? <laughs> Tell yeah. people culturally that God said they're not allowed to drink alcohol or we've said you're not allowed to drink alcohol. Um, it's a very easy fix to this problem. Um, mm. And it's been tried, again, it's been tried forever. So we're, I mean, we tend to think of American prohibition, but um, as long as we've had alcohol, we've had cultures trying to prohibit it. Yeah. So one of the earliest, my, my day job, my, my specialty is early China, and one of the earliest legal uh, codes we have has this uh, prominent uh, ban on alcohol. Anyone caught drinking alcohol is to be immediately put to death. So they they really wow. took the problem of alcohol seriously, and they were they were pretty intense prohibitionists. And yet the Chinese just kept drinking. <laughs> it never the prohibition thing never really took off there. Yeah. Um, and same thing, you know, they tried it in the states and it didn't work. Um, you have religions that prohibit alcohol, and they've had a little bit more success. So when you, it seems that when you, you it's like faith based. Uh, yeah, you link it up to sacred values, and you kind mm. of turn it in. You you put it into the package of religious stuff that's doing right. other functions as well. It seems to stick a little bit better. Um, but even there, you know, we've had so Islam has been prohibiting alcohol for a really long time. If alcohol again only imposes costs on groups. We should all be Muslim now, because um, yeah. especially cultural evolution moves super fast. Um, you get mm -hmm. a new cultural thing that's a great idea; it spreads immediately. Things mm -hmm. like, I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with the work we've done on, on pro-social religions, big God religions. No, me not Joe too familiar. Henrik, no. Yeah, me and uh, Joe Henrik and Nora uh, Ara Noren Zion, Seem Sharif, um, all UBC mm -hmm. people um, have been pushing this idea of the cultural evolution of pro-social religions. Um, and there you see, you get a new cultural idea that solves a problem and bang, it spreads people yeah. either because people adopt it or people who have it kill and <laughs> replace the people who don't have it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and yet this has, this hasn't happened, uh, you know, so I, at one point show a map of where prohibition is in place right now in the world. And it's not very many places. Um, right. What, what places like, are like Edward, what places are currently like very strict prohibitions if you can name like a few just to give an idea saudi arabia i mean they're they're muslim countries um saudi mm. arabia is pretty strict um you know in parts of india so india has got a partial uh, mm. prohibition um but it really is historically in islamic cultures it's really varied how much this was imposed um, yeah there were long periods in, in a lot of places where it was just wink drinking was winked at um elites typically have always continued to drink. And in fact, some of our best wine poetry comes from Persia, 
you know, or mm. you know, technically it was a sin to be <laughs> drinking, and yet they're writing these amazing, you know, poems about how wonderful wine is. And yeah. um, so it's again, you, if it was if prohibition was such a great solution to this problem, you'd think also that prohibitionist cultures would be a little bit more consistent about it, but they're yeah. not. Yeah, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> so those, so cultural, genetic and cultural evolutionary solutions to the problem exist, and yet they haven't taken off. Yeah. And so to me, that suggests there's got to be, we know all about the costs. Mm -hmm. There's got to be something on the other side of the balance sheet in terms of benefits. And that's yeah. what's keeping the genes in play, and it's what's keeping the cultural uh, approval of drinking in play when it really should get eliminated. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, like, there's been attempt after attempt throughout history to stop people from drinking. And I, we see this not just with drinking now, but with, like, drugs as well. You can you can make that comparison to, to marijuana now, too, with the recent, you know, uh, legalization in around North America. But yeah. with drinking, like, what are the – there's – each drug obviously has its benefits. Uh, there's reasons for them. Um, yeah. But what are the main causes that you think are driving, you know, how or let, let's let's go. Let's go back a bit. Let's talk about why drink, why you think drinking has actually created who we are, what it's, how it's shaped our civilization. So what are the positives? What are the benefits of drinking um, other than just having a really good time with your friends or just, you know, feeling a little yeah, bit buzzed? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So pleasure, it can't just be ple pleasure is great. But yeah. evolution doesn't care about pleasure, right? Yeah. Evolution doesn't want us to be happy or care if we're happy. It just wants copies made. Yeah. Um, and so it's got to be doing something functional for us. And so to understand to understand that, I have a whole chapter where I just lay out what a weird species we are of primates, <laughs> right? Um, if you look at us compared to chimpanzees, we're just really strange in a bunch of different dimensions. Um, and so I talk about at one point what I call the three C's that were the creative, cultural, and communal primate. Um, so creative, um, unlike most species, were completely dependent on tool use. You know, cheetahs don't need, they go catch gazelles, gazelles can run, they don't need tools. Chimpanzees use some tools in some situations, but they get along fine without tools. Humans are useless without tools. We, we need tools to do even really basic stuff. Um, you know, we're so dependent on tool, basic tools like fire that we've biologically changed to adapt to them, right? Our teeth have changed, our digestive system has changed to adapt to eating cooked food. We couldn't eat raw food now if we wanted to. So and that's, it's kind of amazing that we, we come out helpless in a way without, without culture and without the tools that cultures give us. Um, and so we're really dependent on creativity. Um, environments are changing, so our tools have to change. We're also competing with other groups who are trying to exploit the environment more efficiently than we exploit it. So we, you know, if they have better tools, we have to out invent them or borrow their tools. Um, and so we're, we're really dependent on creativity. And, and that is one place where alcohol helps. So um, I walk through the literature on, um, first of all, uh, development and creativity. So I look a little bit at Alison Gopnik's work. I don't know if you're familiar with, um, her, especially her more recent stuff. Um, so she's got great experimental data showing that uh, young kids, so like four-year-olds, are great at lateral thinking creativity tasks. So tasks, the Blicket test, right? Where you've got, um, is it a Blicket? And in the condition where it being a Blicket is something kind of that it, it seems counterintuitive, four-year-olds are do really great on it. And there's she has this graph where she's showing decline in performance over development. So four-year-olds are great, adults suck, and it's pretty mm -hmm. much a linear decline as yeah. you age. Um, so uh, what's going Edward, on? Edward, before you go on, yeah. do you want to explain what a blicket is for our listeners that have no clue what a blicket is? <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's basically a, you know, it's a made up test yeah. of, you know, uh, she says, we have this thing that detects when something's a blicket. If we put a blicket on it, it plays music and it lights mm -hmm. up. So tell us if this is a blicket. Yeah. And the intuitive thing is it should be one object, right? Mm -hmm. We tend to think of a blicket should but in the, the lateral thinking one is what she calls the conjunctive condition, where it's actually two things in combination are a blicket. Mm. And kids are able to just Adapt think outside the box yeah. and be like, oh, it's two things. Yeah. Whereas adults 
are like, what's going on here? It's, yeah. it's not the star. It's not the triangle. Yeah. Um, so that that's a kind of classic um, thinking outside the box, what's mm-hmm. sometimes called lateral thinking. Yeah. Um, um, you Another good example is like the remote associate test, right? Where you've got, you get three words and you have to come up with a fourth word that links them. You can't solve these problems through just grinding through possibilities. You have mm-hmm. to kind of relax and see the answer. Right. Yeah. So that yeah. type of creativity is really important for humans. Mm-hmm. Um, we get worse at it as we age. Why is that? Um, it's pretty clearly because our uh, prefrontal cortex or PFC is maturing. Right. Yeah. And so in the book, I lay the performance on the Blicket task with the um, neural pruning that's happening in gray matter and prefrontal mm-hmm. cortex. And, you know, uh, PFC is the last part to mature in humans. And what you know, the short story is what it seems to be doing is giving us the ability to focus on a task, delay gratification, exert mm-hmm. cognitive control. These are all really useful things that we have to have as functional adults. Yeah. But the cost is it interferes with lateral thinking. And mm-hmm. so it's, there's this tension. Um, evolution wants us to be creative, but it also wants us to be able to tie our shoes and get out of the house on time and go to work. Yeah. And it can't those are intention. And so it ends up think going, all right, we're going to go with the prefrontal cortex. <laughs> we yeah. need people to be able to focus. Yeah. Um, so that seems the prefrontal cortex is the enemy here when we're talking about creativity. Mm. So what do we do about that? Um, what we really would like is to be able to temporarily become like four-year-olds again, to have that ability to think outside the box, but still be grown-ups. Yeah. Um, and you could do that with a transcranial magnet, right? You can zap the prefrontal cortex and take it offline, but those are pretty recent inventions and they're not very fun to take to parties. <laughs> um, so what else could you use? Well, maybe a substance that you can make anywhere, you know, it's kind of mm. pleasant to drink, fits, you know, pairs well with food. Sold um, everywhere. So, <laughs> sold everywhere. So that's what alcohol is, this technology that humans have used because one of the main alcohol, the c- cognitive effects of alcohol are really complex. It's been mm-hmm. called, uh, Stephen Brown, the uh, journalist, has called it a pharmacological hand grenade because it's doing, it's hitting all these different systems all at the yeah. same time. Or sometimes yeah. there's a delay. It's really complicated what's going on. Um, but one of the things it's doing is depressing the functioning of the prefrontal cortex. Mm-hmm. So it's taking the PFC, it's down regulating the PFC for a short period of time. And so I'm arguing that that's a great cultural solution to this problem of how do we become childlike when it Mm -hmm. comes to creativity while still being adults who know what questions are important and what we would do with that insight when the, when the, when the drug wears off. Right. Um, Yeah. It's like a temporary harnessing the child's energy. And then you come back to your task oriented prefrontal cortex being like, okay, we can actually do something with this now. Exactly. Exactly. And you know what to be creative about, right? You kind Mm -hmm. of have problems that you're working on. And yeah. so that's one really important function. And there's, and you know, culturally, there's always been this association between alcohol and other drugs, but real alcohol primarily, and and artists and poets and writers, yeah. and that's for a really good reason. It's because it actually does help with creativity, and it actually, yeah. and it also helps with group group creativity. So people mm-hmm. kind of working together to solve a problem. You mentioning that Edward just kind of reminds me of like people going for drinks after work. Absolutely. And like yeah, that, just, that kind of seems like an intuitive thing to be like, I, I'm hitting a wall at work, so let's go have a drink and we can be creative in a group and think together and then, you know, come back the next day more creative. Yeah. I mean, this the project I mentioned to you with Joe and Ara and, and Azim, um, I, I talk about this in the book and I say this not semi-facetiously maybe, but I don't think so. I don't think, so this was part of a big partnership grant we got in 2012. We got one of the first partnership grants at UBC. I don't think that grant would have happened if Mahoney's, that pub, had been Mahoney and Sons, yeah. Yeah, because campus, there was no fire. place to drink. There was no place to drink on campus. And, yeah. but they built Mahoney's finally. It was right at the bus loop. So you yeah. kind of hop in there on your way home. And we started meeting there, me and Joe and Ara and Mark Collard, who's uh, in archaeology, on Fridays after work. And we'd have a beer, or two beers, and we'd start shooting the shit. And 
next thing you know, we have the $3 million grant. And I, and I really think it's because of the unique dynamics that happen. It's, it's partly the creativity thing. So generally in PFC, um, but it's also reducing your inhibitions. So you're more likely to blurt out something that maybe is speculative or outside your field, but you don't care because you're two beers in. Um, your mood is up. So one of the, it's boosting serotonins. It's, uh, it's boosting endorphins. You feel better about the people you're with. Um, and so, so alcohol is really crucial for this kind of um, group creativity. And when I was talking about, the first time I started talking about this was when I was on book tour for trying not to try. And I was, I mentioned this, there is one study on creativity and alcohol. It's um, 2012, so it's older. Um, it's kind of, it's a small N and it's kind of, it's the kind of study you probably wouldn't get away with publishing anymore, you know, in social psychology right now. But it's, it suggests that at 0.08 or so blood alcohol content, your ability to solve these lateral thinking tasks um, is at its height. You do much better at 0.08. Um, and I presented this data at, I was at a Google campus in California and um, the first question, the guy, this guy popped up in the Q&A period. He was like, have you ever heard of the Balmer Peak? And I'd never heard of this. Um, but it's supposedly Steve Balmer, C CEO of Microsoft, legendary coder. The, the legend is that um, he determined that his coding skill peaked at this very specific blood alcohol content. And so he would keep himself hooked up to an IV of vodka or something to just keep himself right at that PAC, um, which is almost certainly made up, but it captures this idea. And then um, after the talk, they were taking me on a tour of the campus. And the first place they took me was their whiskey room. They're like, you have to see this. And they took me to this room that was just an entire wall of single malt scotch. It was the most amazing sight I've ever seen. Really rare, beautiful single malt scotches. And um, bean bag chairs and a foosball table and places to chill out. And they said that, you know, when we're, we're on a project and we run into a, a roadblock, we can't figure out what to do. Instead of banging against it and sitting in front of our computers, we come here and we have, we have a little bit of scotch. We sit on bean bag chairs and often someone will say, yeah, what about this? And our solution is there. So, yeah. so it's clear that successful cultures and organizations are using Knowledge alcohol it, yeah. as a tool in this way. Yeah, that's really, it's really interesting. I, that's kind of just like the epitome of what pe like Google kind of show. I, I feel like 10 years ago, that, that kind of image of like beanbag chairs and people just hanging out was like yeah. the, the creative, like CEOs, like, uh, you know, brainchild. And it seems like it actually has a lot of legs to it and it actually makes sense that you know using that more creative space instead of banging your head against the wall or like staring at a screen for eight hours might not be the most optimal use of our time yeah yeah no i had a actual personal experience of this because when i was writing the proposal for this book i had written like 10 versions of it and my agent was every time she's this manhattanite very <laughs> Very tough to wring any kind of praise out of her. And she's happy to criticize things. So she's like, no, it's boring. It's not good. Yet. And and she was right. She's good. She knows when something pops and when it doesn't. And I was thinking, what am I doing? I was banging my head against the wall. I'd written mm -hmm. 10 versions of this thing. Yeah. Um, and then I was like, holy shit, I haven't even I haven't taken my own advice. I realized yeah. I hadn't written any of it drunk. <laughs> and so I was actually in New Zealand. So this was in this mythical time when we were traveling. <laughs> when you could travel the um, world, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was meeting colleagues in New Zealand and I was, I was meeting them for dinner and I had about two hours before dinner. And so I went down to the hotel bar and I ordered a Negroni and sat there with my laptop and looked at this proposal and was just like, what is it missing? And then all of a sudden the first paragraph of the book, the first paragraph of the introduction just came to, it was almost like I was taking dictation. It just wrote itself. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is what I need. And it was yeah. because I, instead of tr rewriting, rewriting, and I just kind of looked at it and took my PFC and went, eh, <laughs> turned yeah. that down a little bit. <laughs> and that allowed, you know, parts of my brain that weren't communicating or I don't know yeah. what exactly is happening there, but it allowed me to get this insight that that created a very 
catchy first paragraph that became yeah. the beginning of the proposal and the beginning of the book. So, and the beginning of the book is great. For, it's a great paragraph. <laughs> yeah, see, it's, a, it's a good paragraph. It's totally due to 1.25 Negronis. So it was like a sip or two into Negroni number two that I wrote. The that. perfect yeah. IV drip of alcohol blood content. <laughs> yeah, right. blood alcohol content. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, that's so so creativity. Uh, it makes complete sense. And I like that you make that comparison to like, you know, unlocking that kind of like childlike mind in, in you whenever you're you're an adult and things seem quite dry and you know drinking does actually help that creativity flow um so that's a huge part of it, it but you said that communal like you said the three c's were creative cultural and communal so what are the cultural and communal things that are going on when you're drinking i can think of communal you know yeah I'm a lot friendlier when I have a few drinks in me. I'm a lot more affectionate with others, but is that all that it is with the communal? It's, it's more than that. Um, yeah. although that's part of it. So it's definitely that, um, you're feeling better about yourself mm -hmm. and you're feeling better about other people. Um, you, you feel that you're more attractive. So people who are drunk rate themselves as more attractive than um, when they're sober and at, then external uh, raters rate them. Um, but you actually, and then you also, the beer goggle thing is real. You rate other yes. people as more attractive than you would um, if yeah. you were sober. Um, but I, so to talk about the communal thing, um, I think another crucial function of alcohol has been getting us around these cooperation dilemmas that we face in, especially in large scale societies. We, we faced them in small scale societies too, but they become more acute in large scale societies. And these are these dilemmas that go under a lot of different names, a prisoner's dilemma, tragedy of the commons. There's a lot of different ways to describe it and instances of it, but they're all uh, situations where rational, people who are following their rational self-interest are going to get a suboptimal outcome. Um, so, you know, the prisoner's dilemma, I think people are familiar with, right? You, the cops catch you and someone else and they say, we're going to charge you with this crime. But if you rat out, you know, this other guy, you get They'll a get more sentence. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, and it's the best payoff is when you both just shut up and don't, don't rat out anything. the other person. Right. But yeah. you can't communicate with that other person you don't know what they're going to do. Mm. And if you stay quiet and they rat you out, you're super screwed. Yeah. And so the only rational response in a prisoner's dilemma is to defect, to rat out the other person. Um, yeah. But then you're stuck with a suboptimal outcome. Yeah. Um, and then you both go uh, down for worse. You both go down. <laughs> yeah. Um, not as bad. As, you don't go down as bad as if you'd been betrayed, but it's still not mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Um, but I think it's more helpful that, you know, this doesn't happen to us very often in <laughs> everyday life. So it's, it's better <laughs> to think about um, like tragedy of the common series popping up again. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a fisherman in international waters and the tuna stock is depleted and it would be better for all of us, all the fishermen, if we just laid off the tuna for a while let them recover, and then we could all continue to tuna fish. The problem is I can't trust that you're not going to fish tuna. And so really the only rational thing for me to do is get in there and get as much tuna as I can before they all die out as a species, right? So we have these types of situations all the time where um, rational self-interest creates bad outcomes. Um, but how do, you, how do you get around it? You got to trust. I have to trust that that other person is not going to fish. Um, so what I'm arguing is that um, we need a mechanism to get around these, these problems of trust. Um, the way in which we solve prisoners' dilemmas in real life is typically emotional reactions. So you think of the literal prisoners' dilemma, why do they not rat each other out? Because they're loyal, because they're not snitches, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they have, because they have a sense of honor. Right. Yeah. I'm not going to rat you out because I have a sense of honor. Right. Yeah. So it's emotions that allow us to solve prisoners dilemmas. Yeah. But I need to know if I have the sense of honor, like I'm a, we're both gang members and the cops are asking us to rat out our gang. Yeah. Um, I have a sense of honor. I need to know that you have a sense of honor, too. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we interact with people, we're trying to read these emotional signals to see if they're really trustworthy. Um, right. And, you know, Again, honor is a kind of dramatic one. Love or mm -hmm. true friendship, yeah. right? 
we face something like the prisoners. Dile- you face something like a prisoner's dilemma when you help your friend move their couch. Yeah. Right. You you go and move their couch, and it's because you're friends, right? And it would be weird if you were like, could you first sign a contract promising <laughs> that when I move, you will help me move my couch? People yeah. would be like, what's the matter with you, dude? Just, your <laughs> friend, just do it. Yeah. Right. But it's it depends on you trusting that they're a real friend and they'll help you out. Yeah. When you need help. When you need it. Yeah. Um. So we're we're reading facial signals. Um, and fortunately, you know, so I, I dip into signaling theory a bit here. Um, there are difficult to fake signals of things like love and honesty and trustworthiness. Um, you know, it's, if you think about like the Duchenne versus the non Duchenne smile, right. so a the genuine, genuine smile, smile. Yeah. versus the fake smile, they're yeah. different muscle systems. It's very hard to learn how to consciously do a Duchenne smile on command. Right. So we're looking for signals of authenticity in other people, and we're very worried about them being able to fake it. Mm-hmm. Because again, if there's you have these evolutionary dynamics where um, if it would be really beneficial for me to be able to convince you that I'm a really trustworthy friend, I'm an honorable gang member, I love you and I will always be by your side, but then be able to walk away when it's in my interest to do that, right? So yeah. you're going to... You can have a pressure to learn how to fake these displays, mm-hmm. and then you're going to have a counter pressure to learn how to detect faking of the displays. Yeah, and so I think that um, the modern human ability to look at someone and go, "They're an asshole," you know, right. or "They're <laughs> they're selfish and they're not going to help," is it would seem magical to a chimpanzee. Right. And it's the result of usually when we have these amazing abilities, they're the end product of this, these kind of evolutionary arms races. Um, mm-hmm. And so uh, there's this tension between trusting people and being able to uh, take advantage of other people's trust. Right. Now, in this arms race, cultures are not neutral. Cultures want the cheaters to have trouble and they want to help the cheater detectors. Yeah. And so my argument here is that alcohol is one way we, we put our, as a culture, we put our thumb on the scale. So oh, okay. um, if you downregulate your PFC, it has, it has two effects. So if we're both doing it, mm. it makes it harder for you to lie. Yeah. Lying requires Inhibition cognitive gone, control. Yeah. Inhibition yeah. is gone. You also, your working memory gets screwed. Mm. Um, it's hard to lie when you can't keep in mind what your lie is, right? Telling mm. the truth is effortless because you're just reading it off reality, right? Yeah. Lies require a cognitive effort. Um, so you become a worse liar, and which I think people have an intuitive sense of. Um, what's maybe less obvious is that I become a better liar detector. So um, we're bad at consciously picking out lies. Mm. When we're using our PFC and trying to reason through you know, was he twitching his eyebrow? Right. We actually do worse than chance um, picking out lies. Yeah. We do better when we're uh, under pre- So there's no work on this with alcohol directly, but yeah. basically put someone under time pressure, put them in a situation where they can't be using cognitive control, make them do a, you know, an instant thin slicing gut uh, judgment. Mm. They're more accurate. Yeah. And so, so we use alcohol in social situations so we use it in social situations where we need creativity. We also use it in social situations where trust is an issue. Mm. And so that's why, you know, from ancient China to modern day, people who potentially hostile people who need to come to an agreement right. get really wasted before they do it. <laughs> right? They sit down together and they drink together. Right. And I'm arguing that it's in a way, in the same way we shake hands to say, you know, I'm not holding a weapon in my dominant hand. Yeah. If we sit down and I do shots of sorghum liquor with you, I'm mm-hmm. basically taking my PFC out and putting it on the table and saying I'm cognitively disarmed. You know, yeah. whatever I'm saying now is true. Yeah. And so it's been used as a tool to um, help people get past cooperation dilemmas, to trust each other more. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And, and and like, you know, bringing back to the prisoner dilemma approach, you're like, when you need to make a decision of whether or not you can trust somebody, either way, like, so you, it, by drinking, you can figure out whether or not they're, they're tr- if they're not worth their trust, or if they are worth yeah. their trust, because they're, you can make those split decisions when you're, you know, drinking or, or you're drunk or whatever it is. Uh, yeah. That's, that's a really unique take on it. And I think that, like, 
I'm thinking of a, a book that I recently read, Talking to Strangers by Malcolm oh, Gladwell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And it, it's kind of reminds me of those kind of things where, you know, people aren't really good at picking up when people are lying and you're absolutely mm-hmm. right. But like that makes sense that, you know, drinking, lowering those inhibitions, you can get a better read on somebody. And you often do feel like at least my my anecdotal evidence of it is that like, you know, when you drink with somebody, you, you do feel closer to them later uh, afterwards. Mm-hmm. Right. Because you feel like yeah. you've connected with them. You know, once you're you're comfortable enough to go for, for a drink with somebody, then you're often t- tend to be you know more likely to go out for a drink with them or, or spend more time with them afterwards. Right. Uh, but the very act of having a drink with them helps accelerate. Absolutely. Like that, right? Yeah. Because you're you know, you got the endorphin rush. So you have chemical things that are happening that just make you feel more trusting and kind of mm-hmm. bonded with someone. Um, yeah. But then there's these other cognitive things where you're like, oh, I feel like I really know them as a person. Um, yeah. And there's good reasons for that. Yeah. I mean, so, it's just shutting the PFC up, right? Like basically yeah. allowing you to talk freely and openly and genuinely, I guess. I think that's, it's an interesting, uh, there's an d- interesting dichotomy within that too, right? Because a lot of people will read into when people are drunk, you know, drunk thoughts are often like honest thoughts is something yeah, that like you yeah. know, people often no. think of. And like, you know, very tough, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's a reason that's been yeah. an ancient belief that you get truth. Mm-hmm. Um, and Plato supposedly said, um, you know, only children and drunkards tell the truth. <laughs> if you want the truth, you got to ask little kids or people who are drunk. And why? Because they both of them lack PFCs, right? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. So this is also why I think this explains a lot of things. Um, so one of them is that, um, you know, when things like Skype were invented, everyone was like, oh, well, business travel kind of just disappear because yeah. why would you fly to Shanghai and meet with somebody to sign a contract when you could just do it online? Um, and yet until the pandemic, business travel remained unchanged. Uh, mm-hmm. Video conferencing did very little for business travel. And it's for this reason, if you're going to sign a contract with someone for anything more complicated than just supplying paper clips, you know, anything yeah. where there's wiggle room, you want to go sit down with them and have a meal and have mm-hmm. a meal with alcohol. Yeah. Um, before you are going to trust them. And that's people really want to get it in a room with other people and drink before they're going to do anything really important. Mm-hmm. And so um, this is where I think the pandemic has really screwed us in a lot of ways. You know, it's going to all these opportunities to have creative conversations together, to get to trust one another, to build bonds. Those are all really attenuated or completely lost when we don't have in-person drinking anymore yeah i I think that's such an interesting take on it too edward like i'm I'm curious as your thoughts too as how this might develop later on because i've been thinking the same thing i think a lot of people have been thinking this way is you know at a certain point i feel like when things go back to normal whatever that normal new normal will be I was I've been thinking, what will clubs, what will bars look like? What will the, you know, the new uh, under, uh, you know, the the people that are becoming of age that are able to drink at bars legally? What is it going to look different because of what's happened the last two years? Like, do you think that there will be a difference in how we interact or do you think it'll just kind of go back in like, you know, a few months to a year, we'll be back to our normal ways? I think as soon as it's safe, we're going to go back to doing exactly yeah. what we always did because that's yeah. what we want to do, right? <laughs> and we've been starved <laughs> for this kind of... I mean, we've been doing it before it's safe, right? As soon as there's yeah. a slight relaxing, people are out. I mean, I live on David Lamb Park. And so, you know, the first warm weather of this spring, we were just when we were getting into the third wave, right? Yeah. You go out on a sunny day, everyone's out there. Yeah, out on the beach with drinks. Drinking. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> So it's not going to change. We're going to go back. And for good reason, because it's serving, I mean, it's pleasurable, but Mm -hmm. it's also serving these important functions. So many more functions than like any, I imagine any of our viewers had anticipated before listening to this episode. It's, It's a really unique take on how important drinking is beyond the you know the hedonistic approach that you had you mentioned early on, right? With like, you know, masturbation and sexual release and things like that. I, I definitely see that as a big reason why people think that like drinking is is pointless is because it's just it's hedonistic and that's all it is. Yeah. So the pro- and this has really important implications for workplaces and for academia. So you know we're both academics, yeah. um, and there's been especially in this kind of I think of it as a kind of new puritanical age we're in now. Um, 
you know, there's been a real push to make everything dry, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, work events should be dry, um, conferences, you know, people should not be hanging out at hotel bars, at conferences. Um, and there's really good reasons to be worried about all that, right? Yeah. Um, sexual harassment, sexual assault, just even making people feel uncomfortable is really bad. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think the problem is our reasoning about this in academia and in industry has been alcohol in the workplace. Here are all the costs, yeah. sexual harassment, sexual assault, drunk driving, you know, all these really bad things that could happen. Um, what are the benefits? Pleasure, right? Yeah. And if, if it's going to be fun versus lawsuits, yeah. fun's always going to lose. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the wrong way to think about it. It's it's um, all these bad things that could happen, mm -hmm. but it's group creativity. It's bonding. It's finding co-authors who you never would have started a conversation with if you hadn't had a Negroni and two sips of the same. <laughs> right? um, you start talking to people you would never talk to. Um, yeah. As a you know, as a grad student, we would go. We would have. I remember this is one year we had this year long grad seminar. And it was once a week, and I think it was on a Friday, and then we would go to the campus pub afterwards, whoever wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And the professor would spot us a couple pitchers of beer, and we would sit and drink beer. And information got exchanged in that environment, and new connections got formed in a way that would never happen otherwise. Yeah, um, absolutely. And of course, venues like that can be you know, a place where predators then take advantage of people. But you need to see the positive functions as well. Yeah. I mean, and I, I think it's an interesting, I mean, it's a really good point. I completely agree. I think that my, me as a PhD student, I, I'm here because of drinking and I, I, I feel like, <laughs> okay, you know, like, there you, go. That's a pretty uh, you know, point. going to conferences and meeting people and being creative and going out to the bar afterwards is, is almost more important in some of those early stages as a young, you know, you know, academic or just you know business wise meeting yeah. and interacting with people and getting along and connecting with people is really like it's been ingrained in me as a young kid that like your connections and who you meet and who you are as a person will be the biggest driver of where you're going to get and mm -hmm. it's interesting that as you get older drinking plays a role in that sometimes in the sense that like, you know that people are more open when you're drinking and, and and being a nice person and showing that you're a nice person in that prisoner dilemma that you, they can trust you that you're loyal uh, right. or that you have things to contribute that can really benefit you in your career or your academia or whatever it is yeah. and i think that's really interesting that you know it's not new it's not new that uh, academics are risk averse first <laughs> yeah <laughs> and yeah. then and then thinking about the positives afterwards yeah and to be fair i mean you're a dude Right. Yeah, so if you were absolutely. an attractive woman, your experience of, you know, going to the hotel bar or, you know, yes. having drinks with supervisors may have been really different. Right. So absolutely. Yeah. That's a really, really good point. Words. Privilege is, is something that you have to take into consideration, especially when in the, you're in those interactions uh, and yeah. with with females in STEM and in just in career and in, in general, uh, drinking alone at a, at a bar and being able to connect with people is not the same thing for everybody. Yeah. 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 So that's, I mean, the end of the book is where I talk about these issues, right? So there are definitely these benefits, but we mm -hmm. have to keep in mind all the real, real costs, right? And the, yeah. and also just the way in which if, you know, people are getting all this create creativity and bonding out of alcohol, um, it really marginalizes people who can't or don't or can't drink. So people right. who are Muslim, people who are recovering alcoholics, people who are pregnant, people who need to get up early the next morning to take the kids to daycare, right? Yeah. There's a way in which structurally drinking favors unattached males <laughs> in a yeah. way, um, and especially unattached white males, right? So kind mm -hmm. of uh, privileged men that should, should concern us and really make us, we wanna be able to preserve the benefits of that kind of communal drinking while fixing it in ways or putting in safeguards that make sure yeah. that, you know, to the extent possible, you're not, dis people are not disadvantaged by this kind of, the, the negative flip side of all the, hey, we made a great new connection is this kind of cronyism and we become mm. buddies because we drink together. And then yeah. 
you know, the female grad student who was made uncomfortable by all these comments. guys drinking at the yeah. hotel bar or comments goes home yeah. early and she doesn't get the postdoc because yeah. she didn't have the conversation that you and I had because you were doing shots with me. Right. That's not okay. And so, yeah. you know, that's, that's something that needs to be fixed and it's, it's a tricky thing to fix. I'm sure it would be like, I, it, it's, it's, it'd be so tough to, to deal with all those different boundaries and those things that are, you know, not visible at first sight, but the huge barriers to entry. And, and I think that uh, an additional point that I think is really interesting is like, you, you know, having time and being able to have a drink at night with yeah. other people is super important, right? Where people, you know, underprivileged people might not be able to, you know, have that time. They might have to look after their kids. They might have to go pick their kids up from daycare, things like that. Like, or they might not be able to afford daycare. Like these are so many things um, yeah. that are barriers to that. And it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of, it, it almost gives you that like frat feel, like right? You're not, you're not invited yeah. to the frat or the sorority and you know, you're losing all these connections because of that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the dark side of, of alcohol based sociality is the way, you know, you don't get an in group without an out group. So you yeah. create this in group and now people are excluded and that, right. that's not done in a fair way. That's problematic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, th I think that's a really good point. I am glad that you talked about that. I, um, I have a couple questions just to kind of round out. I mean, we've talked a lot about, there's so much more in your book. Like uh, you, you use it. I really like the use of uh, Greek mythology throughout your book as well. Um, I'm just a big fan of anytime you can make a connection to Greek mythology. I'm, I'm, I'm all in and you do a quite, quite a, quite a good job and, and consistently are bringing in like different types of mythology and, you know, um, Hist historical like uh, commentary on why we're drinking and why, why we've gotten where we we've gotten. Um, but um, I have a couple questions that are just random that as I was reading a bit of your book and I wanted to kind of get your opinion on them or maybe mm -hmm. some anecdotal stories. Yeah, sure. um, what are some of the, you, you talk about a bunch of different cases, but what are some of the most intense or dedicated things that people have done throughout history to get high or drunk that you can think of? There's no limit. <laughs> so there's no limit to what people will do to get high or drunk um so this is again this is part of the puzzle to explain right yeah. so um you know people who are uh in a in an impoverished environment will ferment leather they'll make alcohol they'll make alcohol out of anything you, you, that'll ferment you know any kind of carbohydrate um They'll search in the local biome for something that'll... So if there's a psychoactive plant in a local environment, people have been using it for thousands of years. There are no <laughs> undiscovered psychoactives because people have been trying everything, right? right. Um, and people, I mean, the dangers involved, like especially um, some of these psychedelics. So I talked a little bit about this, this uh, bean that grows in the Sonoran Desert that um, will get you really high if you're an adult and you have half of it, but if you have a full one, it'll kill you. <laughs> and it's just like, you know, how many people died figuring yeah. that out, right? The um, dose management. The dose <laughs> yeah. management. And then like um, poisonous toads. So like there's mm -hmm. a one, one uh, hallucinogen is, is uh, it's a secretion from a toad. It is just dis disgusting and dangerous. It's also poisonous, so you can really misdose on that. Yeah. Um, but people, people just want to get high, and they'll do it. Um, so it's it's the getting messed up cognitively has been this amazing focus of human ingenuity and effort over the millennia, and and that's really it's really should be surprising. It should be more surprising to us than it is. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. You know, if you look at, you know, the settling of um, the the Americas when European colonists came, the first thing they do is build a saloon, right, or a pub. They build a, sometimes a church first, but then the second thing is a place to drink. Yeah. Um, they will bring on the first voyage, they'll bring stills with them to make distilled liquors. Um, mm -hmm. uh, well, there's one stat, this is, um, uh, whose book? this um this is a book called drunk or drinking um but the uh magellan's when he went on his voyage of discovery the amount 
of wine and sherry that the cost of the wine and sherry that he brought with him was more than the cost of one of his ships. You know, like he just, the amount of you know, money and just, you know, storing all that and transporting it um, is unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in Australia, the first Australian colony, um, alcohol became the currency. There was, um, they had some alcohol with them and people wanted it so badly. It, it became the de facto currency of the early Australian um, colony. So, so alcohol has been central to political power and control, being able to dispense it. Um, mm -hmm. And people will do almost anything to figure out a way to get to get altered. Yeah, <laughs> to get altered. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I think it's 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 so interesting, just the levels at which people go. Uh, and, and, you know, licking toads is, is one of those things. I'm sure there's millions yeah. other ways that it, and it, it's just it's fun to think about. <laughs> I guess not fun is the appropriate, not the appropriate word, but there's a lot of things that people have done throughout history to figure out what what can get them into an altered state and what can cre create these like different uh, mood states. Um, it's quite interesting. Um, do you, I, I just kind of want to get your opinion on how things have changed since the, the, you know, the beginning of time when it comes to drinking in your opinion, has it always been the same? Is it, you know, is it always been just people kind of congregating together or what's, what benefits, I guess it's kind of one of the negatives as well. Has there been a lot of people drinking alone? Cause I think that's, that's kind of like the the argument in my head is that most people don't drink alone. So that's, yeah. you know, that is, it's not just about the pleasure. It's about that communal, you know, that create mm -hmm. that, that being together, that kind of experience yeah. together. Is that why people are not drinking alone often? And, and that's why it's usually it's the problem, uh, you know, alcoholism and things like that cause that when you're dependent on it. Yeah. So I, in the last chapter, which is about the dangers of, called the dark side of Dionysus, right? The dangers of intoxicants, and especially alcohol. I talk about these two innovations of modernity that um, distillation and isolation that have been relatively recent developments and they do change the kind of, um, the alcohol is always balancing on this razor between benefit and cost, right? It can be mm -hmm. very quickly get very dangerous. Um, these developments, tip it more in the danger direction. Um, yeah. So first of all, distillation. Um, people don't realize how recent an invention distillation is. Um, so naturally fermented beverages have a ceiling on their um, alcohol content. So um, ABV, alcohol by volume, maxes out at about 11 or 12%. Um, okay. And that's because the yeast are producing alcohol they're resistant to alcohol, but only up to a point. So at a certain point, alcohol level gets too high, they shut down, and that's mm. as, as far as you're going to get. Um, and so for almost all of our history with alcohol, there's been like this um, safety device. It's like a seatbelt, right? Um, you can only <laughs> get something that's so strong. And in yeah. fact, you know, in most cultures, most cultures are drinking some type of what we'd probably call a beer, you know, it's a fermented yeah. thing from grains. Um, and they're typically, typically coming in at about 2 3% ABV, yeah. so quite weak. Um, and so it's hard to get, um, it's hard to get dangerously drunk on something at 2 3% ABV. Yeah. Um, it's impossible to kill yourself. Like you can't get to passing out and having your um, lungs stop working. Um, just but, from the sheer volume that you have to consume. Yeah, from it. you'd have to consume. Yeah. You just there's no way you could physically do it, right? Yeah. Um, and it just slows you down. If you're drinking a, a light beer, there's kind of limit to how fast you're going to get drunk. Um, then humans figured out how to distill, like to get around the safety device, basically. And the the getting around thing is taking that weak beer or wine, um, heating it up, the ethanol comes up has is very volatile it comes off first and if you can figure out a way to capture it and then turn it into a liquid again you've mm. got almost pure ethanol right um, and that's what distilled liquors are they're yeah. they're um they allow you to get around this natural limit and so you can get up to you know vodkas could be like 90 something percent abv mm. um that's a whole it's really a different drug um yeah. it's so concentrated 
and can get you messed up so quickly that it really should be thought of as a different drug um, mm. than beers and wines. And so, so distilled liquors are a lot more dangerous. And all of the really big um, kind of pathologies of drinking that we've seen in history. So um, there was a gin craze in England um, in the 18th century where, uh, I mean, society was starting to break down from people getting having access to this cheap gin um, mm. and just getting completely wasted. Um, when the Soviet Union broke up in the 90s, there was the, this incredible drinking epidemic that lowered male uh, life expectancy, went down like something like six or seven years, which is a lot. Like it's, it was Jesus. a decade, right? Um, from And it's clear that it was driven by vodka consumption. Right. Um, so, so distilled wow. liquors are really dangerous, and, and we need to keep that in mind when we're thinking about um, the benefits of drinking. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is what you pointed out, isolation. And so especially now, especially like, now, especially in the COVID time, I've actually just written something about COVID drinking, yeah. um, drinking, people's drinking has gotten a lot more unhealthy in the pandemic because it's, it's an extreme version of what was already happening, which is that we have access to alcohol in a, in a private way. So, and it's essential. <laughs> and it's, it's essential. And it's, you know, that's, I talk about that in the book. That, but you, you in agreement with it, that it is essential, though, it is, right? It yeah, is. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, the, you know, the early debates about what was essential is like golf courses. You know, <laughs> but everyone's like liquor stores are essential, right? Yeah, um, yeah. There was no, there was no debate on that though. It was no so, debate. it was so, and it's, I, I, I know that probably brought just a smile to your face it whenever did, you read. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, it was just, it party. was non-negotiable yeah. that you needed liquor. There was one state, um, I think Pennsylvania, tried for a couple hours to to close down liquor stores, and there was so much outside. <laughs> that they were like, "Oh, sorry, okay, it's an essential service." Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, for most of our history, the only way you would get access to alcohol is in a communal ceremony. Like you would okay. meet in a communal environment. Um, there's typically someone who's in charge. So there's the host of the banquet or the toastmaster. There's a lot of cultures have this official position. Someone's a toastmaster and they're controlling the pace of the drinking. Um, so like in the Greek symposia, there was a symposiarch, the kind of ruler of the symposium, this wine drinking party. Um, and they were in charge of mixing the one they the Greeks didn't drink um, uh, uncut wine they would mix it with water um, and the symposiarch was in charge of mi deciding what the mixture was going to be so he could make it a little stronger if he thought things were slowing down he could dilute it more if he thought things were getting out of hand um, very similar thing in in ancient China to this day in China um, at a banquet the host is in charge of of proposing toasts. And you don't, at a Chinese banquet, you don't sit there just drinking as much by Joe um, sorghum liquor as you want. You drink when there's a toast. And so by pacing the toast, you can ramp things up or slow things down. Um, even in really what seemed like completely unstructured uh, social situations, people are affecting your drinking. <clears throat> so even at like a house party, I mean, it's obvious in a pub where you're doing rounds, right? You, you you're drinking a little bit too fast you finish your pint you gotta you see wait. everybody else is still drinking yeah yeah, yeah you <laughs> yeah. gotta wait right because yeah. we're not gonna order another round until everyone wants another round yeah that paces your drinking yeah um even in like a house party where you would think everyone's just drinking as much as they want people there's been some good ethnographic literature on this um people pay attention um mm. and sometimes there's even kind of informal rules about you don't go recycle your bottles you put them next to your seat so everyone kind of can mm. in an instant see how many beers you've had um, <laughs> so there's there's ways in which we're constantly regulating each other's drinking in these subtle yeah. ways even if we don't have the kind of formal toastmaster type thing and so yeah. that 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 helps us that's like a safety feature as well it's just like the mm. the you know the abv safety feature it keeps you from getting from drinking out of hand mm -hmm. um and all of that is gone when you can drive through a drive through liquor store and have them load up a bunch of vodka in the back of your SUV and just drive home with it. So the fact that yeah. in your private home, you have access to, I mean, 
even in my apartment here in Vancouver, I have enough alcohol to kill a small village of people. That don't have <laughs> once, right? um, it, it's just unprecedented historically for us to have private access to alcohol like that. Yeah. Um, and then COVID has made it so much worse because we're not drinking in public at all now. All of our drinking has gone private. Um, yeah. And you know now we don't have any of the social cues anymore. Um, we're not even going to work, right? So at least like pre-COVID days, you don't drink it during the work day, right? You, but now it's like, what the fuck? It's two in the afternoon. What does it matter? I, I, I'm Zooming. It's Wednesday. Today. It feels like a Friday. It's Wednesday. Well. Yeah, it's Wednesday. It feels like a Friday. <laughs> People's drinking has become really dysregulated in terms of the time of the day because we don't have the same kind of rhythms that we used to have. Yeah. Um, and it's like, um, you know, I, I compare having private access to alcohol to being kind of like these rats. I talk about these stress studies with rats and basically rat, rats self-medicate with alcohol when they're stressed out. Um, and they have these feeding tubes where they can just mm -hmm. help themselves. Self -soothe, that's like us. Yeah, yeah, they're self, yeah. that's like us, right? We're self-soothing <laughs> with alcohol. And if you can just, yeah. um, you know, if I'm not out with friends where I have to order a second glass of wine, and it's an act I have to make publicly, I have to wait for it, yeah. it costs me some money. Instead, mm -hmm. I have a bottle of wine in the fridge and on my way through the kitchen, I can just top up my glass. Yeah. Shit's going to get out of hand. A lot faster, <laughs> right? And it's just yeah. not all the safety features are gone when we're drinking alone at yeah. home. Yeah. Um, so that's really dangerous. And, I, and there's evidence, there's, there's anecdotal, and now we're starting to get some actual survey data um, that problem drinking has gone way up in the last year yeah. for precisely yeah. this reason. Even, I mean, even thinking about like um, individuals with partners in in, how, in like their own yeah. homes with COVID, at least you have one person to to measure yourself and measure your drinking with, right? Like you think of, yeah. you know, walking by, getting a gla glass of wine. You're like, oh, do you want a glass of wine as well? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You finish yours earlier. That's or, an or indication. Your, or your drinking. partner's like, hey, oh, getting yourself another yeah. glass of wine? Yeah. Like, another one? Yeah. <laughs> this too? Or at least they'll look at you a little sideways, right? Yeah. yeah so you're, you're catching all those cues. And I, I, it's a really interesting point that I didn't really think about. And like, it kind of brings me back not that I ever under drank underage, but if I were to have drank underage, yes. uh, you know, those those interactions are happening and you're learning in like it's not intuitive that you're learning that way. But you're you're seeing, you know, how people drink and then you're seeing problematic drinking at a younger age where no one really knows what's going on. You know, they're yeah. just they're trying yeah. to learn the substance uh, or even just say, you know, it doesn't have to be underage. Like when you're just learning how to drink in parties and stuff like that, house parties, you'll see people that are doing that and you're, and you are acknowledging, oh, that's another drink in their hand that they didn't have a few minutes mm -hmm. ago. Yeah. And you're, you're adjusting your behavior based on those things. And I really, you know, we aren't, we can think, uh, you know, on the, on the fly and, and adapt to these things, but you're not really realizing that you're catching these cues. Yeah. Yeah. And they're mostly yeah. subtle. They're mostly not conscious. You don't necessarily think about them. Um, mm -hmm. Even like if your partner just gives you a little kind of sideways glance when you're pouring that glass of wine, they may not say yeah. anything. You may not even consciously notice it, right? But yeah. it may kind of make you pause before you go back and do it again, right? They may they so, may not even do anything. You might be looking for a response, yeah, knowing right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that yeah, you're going yeah. already, right? So we've, yeah. we've lost all of that. Um, yeah. And it's, yeah. I've noticed it because I've been, I've had a weird pandemic because my partner's yeah. in the States on the East Coast mm. of the US. And yeah. I, oh. we were separated by a closed international border. Um, what a nightmare. And so every time I go to see her, I come back and I have to quarantine. For, I've done seven quarantines. <laughs> so I have spent 14 weeks alone in my apartment. Um, mind numbing with the ability to order alcohol <laughs> yeah <laughs> right they, they deliver so now they deliver they deliver they <laughs> deliver it could just it's just brought to my house right um yeah. and i i noticed it's my drinking definitely my drinking habits got worse um yeah. being cooped up not even able to go outside for mm -hmm. you know, two weeks at a time um yeah. it's just not healthy so this is kind of an extreme version of a trend that was already part of modern life. Um, yeah. where people drinking has moved more into the home, mm -hmm. the private home, yeah. and that's not, not entirely healthy. Yeah, it's it kind of magnified a problem that was existing not as 
it wasn't as prevalent maybe but now you know because of the circumstances there's more people doing engaging in it yeah. i think um one thing that i find interesting is to kind of retrospectively think about how i've been drinking in in covid and zoom calls and and video calls while drinking with friends is something that's become a reality yeah, now yeah zoom cocktail hours yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like it's not scratching the itch if it makes sense. Like, I mean, it's yeah, not doing it's what, it, what it usually do does, right? Hours suck. Yeah. <laughs> no one's going to do those once we're at a lockdown. Right? <laughs> that is something that I don't yeah, think any yeah. company should invest any money in or time in because yeah, I just think yeah. it does, does not make sense. And so why do you think that that it's something that I've always been curious about, just like with our communication, the way that the world's kind of going with the way that we communicate along, online and electronically why is it so important that we're in person and yeah. not having, you know, what's what's the difference between having a virtual reality setup and having somebody physically there with you, you know? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not a dualist. So I think that if you could have a virtual reality setup that was perfect, yeah, it wouldn't make any difference, right? You'd have yeah. everything you need. Yeah. Um, but what's missing, it's just massive amounts of data are being lost, right? Um, yeah. I'm missing a lot of the details of your body language. Um, we're not drinking the same stuff, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm over here mixing a cocktail by myself and you're getting yourself a beer. Yeah. Um, you're, you're not, not walking listening. into the kitchen with them, like going and like, yeah. you know, carrying the call when they're going to get their drinks and things like that. Yeah, you're not um, listening to the same music because typically, you know, you're, you're listening to the same music. Your mu mood's being regulated by the music without you even noticing it. Um, you're missing smells. I mean, I think, you know, we're not like dogs, but we do use smells in socialization. All that's gone. Um, it's just not, there's a kind of um, collective effervescence, to use Durkheim's phrase, um, that happens in person when you're drinking together that Zoom just kills. Um, it's also even even like really small time delays fuck yes. everything up, right? Oh, so the timing of conversations. Um, yeah. People talk over each other a lot more because you're lacking the normal signals you would have of, oh, it's my time to talk. Yeah. Um, and there's no better way to kill any kind of sense of solidarity than timing problems, right? Feeling mm -hmm. like you're not getting me or we're not syncing in the right way. Yeah. So, oh my goodness. I'm shuddering at the thought of like older, older times when Skype was like laggy beyond yeah. like two seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's horrible, right? Yeah. yeah. But even this, even, you know, we're talking right now, this is a pretty good connection. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not it's not great, right? No. And we 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 are talking over each other every once in a while in a way we yeah. wouldn't if we were in person. Absolutely. Um, and that's just because video, you know, video is very data poor um, yeah. compared to in person socializing. Absolutely. I I look forward to, you know, having in person interviews as a, a podcaster is just it's such a different experience yeah. and so much more yeah. enjoyable. And, yeah. uh, you, you know, I, I really look forward to having this conversation with you, too, Edward, because like we start Brain Buzz was started off as the whole intention was actually the, the idea came from us drinking at um, it's an it's the newer bar on UBC that's closer to MOA. I forget what it's called. It's the grad student pe uh, pub. Kerner's. Uh, yeah, Kerner's. Yeah, yeah. Kerners, so yeah. so yeah. we were uh, in my first year master's. We were in Kerner's, uh, talking with a bunch of students that were uh, my my colleagues having drinks, and we were talking about how it would be awesome to talk about research on a podcast. And that's how this yeah. started. That's uh, how everything starts. It's how it always <laughs> does. Everything that's how I think that's how all podcasts start is over a yeah. drink, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and and we and we did we developed it off of that. We're like, yeah, you know what? Actually, it would be a great idea. And you, you know, the PFC shut off for a bit, and then we mm -hmm. we turned it back online, and we we actually got a going and i think um the brain buzz was off of the idea that we'd have drinks with our our, our guests whenever yeah, we had them in person so we haven't had to be able to do that for so long and yeah. it's you know it's it's unfortunate obviously we still have great guests and have great time but like i would have loved to have a drink with you sit down with you and and, yeah. and do that and hopefully in the future we can do that sometime um uh, yeah. and i see the value in it much more clearly now after having this this talk with you yeah great yeah this is awesome um 
thanks so much, Edward. I really do appreciate you coming on. Um, is there anything else that I don't? Th- we've talked so much about it. I mean, let's let's talk about your book. I'll give you a I'll give you a chance to to push uh, some public publicity for your book. It's a great book. I've I've read it. I'm the only one that gets the option to read it right now, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it comes out June 1st, 2021. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's out soon. Yep. Okay. Amazing. I'll let you, here's your, here's your chance. Uh, do, do your publicity spiel. Cause I know you have it much more trained than I do. <laughs> no, I, do, I don't really have a spiel. I mean, no. <laughs> uh, the book, I mean, the, the title I think explains it pretty well. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, you know, why do people drink? Why do we like to get drunk? why is drinking at the center of every civilization we know and and the ones that don't have alcohol at the center substitute some other intoxicant in its place that functionally does a very similar thing um so this the centrality of alcohol and the the ubiquity of it and the antiquity of it the fact that we've been doing it as long we've been making and drinking alcohol as long as we've been doing anything organized um, in fact, the argument, uh, a lot of archaeologists now believe that um, we settled down and created agriculture to make beer. <laughs> Not Beer wasn't a side effect of us making bread. It was, it's called the beer before bread hypothesis. Um, it's becoming increasingly clear that hunter-gatherers were gathering and making beer before they were doing agriculture. Um, so it's such a basic drive and it's so central. It probably even literally gave rise to civilization, to people settling down. Um, and so I think that this is a puzzle. Why it's so central and why it's so ancient is something we take for granted. And it help, it's helpful to take a step back and put on our evolutionary spectacles and look at it through the lens of Darwinian thinking and and problematize it to say hey you know this is actually kind of mysterious why we do this and what could be the reasons and and once we've done that it doesn't solve like i think questions of you know what's the role of alcohol in um a, you know academia or um in grad seminars after seminar gatherings there's no clear answer but we can't come up with a good answer unless we know all the costs and benefits until we really have a good scientific understanding of why humans drink in the first place. So that's all I'm trying to do is, is give us, reveal this mystery that's hiding in plain sight that we don't even question. Um, and once we see that it's a mystery, we can start to understand its evolutionary dynamics a little bit better. And that helps us make better decisions as both individuals and societies. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, again, it's a, it's a really fun book to read, which is, you know, it's nice to have guests on that write fun things to read because yeah. we're usually yeah. just having researchers on just talking about the research. Through the journal article, yeah. <laughs> uh, but this, you know, it's, it is a really enjoyable read for anybody that's, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're interested in science at all. It's just, it's just a, a really enjoyable read. Um, so again, that's drunk. How we sipped, danced and stumbled our way to civilization by Edward Slingerland. Such a good book, and it comes out June first. Accessible pretty much everywhere, I imagine. You can probably grab it anywhere you get books, um, and uh, and that comes out really soon. So we're going to be releasing this close to that time, so people will be ready to grab it within the week, I imagine. Great. Um, but uh, thanks again, Edward. This was so much fun, uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, I appreciate it. Is there if there's anything that you anything you want to plug other than that, or is there any way that you want if people want to connect with you? Is there anything that they can do to 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 find you? Yeah, I've got a new web. I have a new website now, so it's just Edward Slayerland, all one word dot com. Um, awesome. So that's got all my information about all my trade books, academic books, um, my academic work, journal articles, and stuff like that. So great. Um, yeah. No. And if and if we publish this before uh, it comes out, they can always check out your previous book, Trying Not to Try, which came out in 2014, right? So yep. that's accessible anywhere. You can get that, and you know, just warm up for for yeah. drunk on yeah. June 1st. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks, thanks so much, Edward. This is so much fun. I think I really appreciate you coming. Yeah, thanks.